I'm a 29-year-old female. Call me Mary. I worked in a mental health and psychiatric ward in a hospital for about seven years before I resigned last year. It can be really grueling, but it's ultimately rewarding work. I mostly conduct individualized therapy for inpatients who don't respond to outpatient or group therapy well. I advocate for their needs and am able to make real connections with people who sometimes just need some extra support. It's really opened my eyes to the scope of the human condition, forgive me if that sounds a bit pretentious, and what others' lives are like besides my own. Every once in a while, though, I get someone in my ward that I don't have the qualifications to treat. Not for lack of trying, mind you. Sometimes they just don't click with anyone in our facility. And that's just the state of things. You just do the best you can to help them adjust until they find someone they can open up to. There was one patient who transferred into my care, though, that I genuinely grew to fear despite my efforts to keep up an empathetic professional front. Barring names, the patient was transferred to the mental health ward during my last year there. He was in his 30s and really, really thin. According to his primary doctors, he had stopped eating because he was convinced his wife of five years was trying to poison him. He began to get belligerent and borderline violent with the wife, swearing at her if he thought she was behaving suspiciously. At first, he was admitted to the ICU because of his poor health. But after a few weeks, he got approval for a referral upstairs to psychiatric. That's where I came in. Our first few sessions, I would do most of the talking. He was very quiet and withdrawn, but he seemed to acknowledge that maybe he was wrong about his wife, which was a start to me. I asked him why he thought his wife was trying to poison him in the first place. He said the suspicion had started when she went out of the room to pour him a drink rather than just bringing the bottle right in. He said she had told him the bottle was almost out anyway, and she saw no point in bringing it all the way over only to immediately throw it away. But he didn't believe her. He gradually opened up a bit more from there. He said they'd been having some problems prior to his beliefs. They had separated for a few months before the first incident, and he often described her as looking at him with what he described as bitchy contempt. Like she was pissed at him, but he didn't even know what he'd done wrong. I thought we were making some good progress. I reminded him that each incident of his wife trying to poison him had a rational explanation and let him work out the reasons for himself with some gentle guidance. That was when the first accusation came up. He sat across from me in my client chair one day, there was a desk between us, and I felt good knowing there was some sort of barrier there. He suddenly grew quiet in a moment where we were talking about another incident with his wife, something involving his birthday cake. He sternly said, Are you with that bitch? Excuse me? I said out of reflex. Every bit of conflict training rushed through my head as I recomposed myself. I cleared my throat. I apologize, but what exactly do you mean by that? I could see the veins bulging out of his neck as he narrowed his eyes at me. His voice was low and nearly a growl now. You're with that bitch, aren't you? My wife. You're trying to get in my head so next time I'll eat what she gives me, right? Don't deny it. I don't know your wife, I said gently. Now, how about we take a moment and he suddenly slammed his fist down on the desk. No, no, you're trying to poison me too. Don't talk to me. He seemed like a completely different person from when I met him. He started spitting and swearing, leading security to be called in. They had to sedate him to take him back to his room. All the while, I was pushed back against the window to my own office. Unable to move and completely rattled, my hand shook as he was dragged out of the room. I felt like I was in the sights of someone who genuinely wanted to hurt me or possibly kill me. Although he didn't get the opportunity to physically harm me, I was pretty sure he really wanted to. He'd been supplied with nutrient supplements that had returned him to his former strength, and I'm very small, so he would have had no problem tossing me around the room like a rag doll if he wanted to. I was offered the rest of the day off, which I gratefully took to process these events. I needed a fresh mind to come back the next day and work with other patients. 
I didn't know how I would deal with this guy going forward, especially if he felt he couldn't trust me anymore, but I decided to cross that bridge when I came to it. The next day, the patient was brought in. He wanted to apologize and said his wife had baked me a cake for taking care of him. Now, I'm not allowed to accept any food items from patients or outside family members, so I said I was grateful but I had to politely decline. He immediately became irate, asking in an angry tone, Why won't you eat it, huh? This caught me off guard. For one, he was being treated for a possible delusion that his wife was trying to poison him. For two, it was strange he trusted his wife with any sort of food at this stage. For three, he'd just accused me the day prior of working with his wife to try and kill him too. So this sudden turnaround was very startling. He became very insistent. Just eat the fucking cake, he said over and over, to the point where security had to be called again to escort him out. He was released from my care soon after, for fear of my safety. I don't know what's happened to him since. My boss and a police officer called to the scene suspected that he'd put something into the cake his wife had given him, either to support his delusion or to specifically target me. Which possibility is correct, I'll never know. I resigned a few weeks later for a different, less stressful career option. To anyone who works in psychiatric, be real careful out there. When I was 13, I was completely in love with the girl next door. Her name was Catherine, and she also happened to be my best friend. We would spend the night at each other's houses as kids all the time. Watch movies, paint our nails. It was in my first year of high school that I started to feel differently about her. Don't get me wrong, I'd always loved her of course, but it started to feel more intense. I started thinking about her more often, and every time I saw her I would notice more and more how pretty she was. She had bright blue eyes and dirty blonde hair, and her smile caused my heart to skip a beat. I was so scared to confess to her though. For one thing, I didn't know if she felt the same way or if she was gay at all. The topic just never came up, as we were too busy fangirling over bands we liked or new movies coming out. The last thing I wanted to do was mess up our lifelong friendship at that point. However, the second problem was bigger and more concerning. We lived in a really conservative area that still held on to those traditional values. I knew that going public, especially at the time with my feelings, would be at the very least frowned upon. So, for the longest time, I hid in the shadows while being by her side every day through high school. We still hung out every weekend and after school a few times a week, driving through town and telling each other all our secrets. We still shared a blanket on movie night, though now my heart would leap whenever she threw her arms around me because of a big jump scare or romantic moment. She really trusted me completely with her biggest fears and worries, and so did I with her, minus that one really big thing. As graduation was rapidly approaching, and the air was growing warmer with each passing day, I noticed that her affection toward me had been heating up too. I don't know if it was just my imagination running wild, but she began to hug me for a lot longer and told me I was pretty a lot more often too. On the night of our senior prom, I took her aside. We'd gone with a group of friends, so there were no dates involved. I worked up the courage and stole a kiss. To my disbelief and happiness, she simply said, I was waiting for you to do that, you know. We started a secret relationship from that night on. We still kept our usual dynamic with movie nights and boy bands and whatever hobbies we had, but without going into detail, I didn't think I could be happier. I loved her and she loved me. We knew we'd go to the same college together and I honestly couldn't wait to get out of this town. I know it sounds like naive and wishful thinking, but I honestly thought I was going to marry Catherine someday. One day in late August though, a couple of weeks before we were set to pack for school, Catherine just stopped talking to me. 
I couldn't reach her on cell, and whenever I called her house, her dad would always answer and say something along the lines of, Oh, Catherine is out right now. I'll have her call you back later. Her window faced mine on the side of the house, so after the second day of her not calling me back, I knew that something was wrong. I tried to get a peek in her window to see if she was there, but the curtains were drawn shut and her bedroom light was turned off as well. She usually kept her light on until midnight, as she was a night owl. By that point, I was starting to get really worried. I started searching every place I knew she could be. The candy shop, the lake, all the country roads leading out into the woods. I asked her co-workers at the local Hannaford if they'd seen her recently, and they all shook her head no. She hadn't shown up for work three days in a row, and that certainly was not like her. Catherine was hardworking, driven, and always called if she was going to be late or wasn't coming in. She'd always call me, too. That was when I finally broke down. I went to knock on her door, determined to find out what was going on. I stood on the front stoop, my shoulders slumped and eyes pricking with tears. My entire body was tense and wired, as if I hadn't slept in a week. I was about ready to burst through the doorway when she answered, and hug her and ask her where the hell she'd been, if she answered. And so I knocked. Her dad opened the door, looking as if he'd just been in the middle of a nap. Catherine's dad had always been a little indifferent to me, never really talking to me whenever I came over, or when he had to pick her and I up from school. Today, I could see a scowl of disgust plainly on his face. He regarded me coldly. Um, hello, is Kat here? I'm really worried about her and I need to talk to her. I told you she was out! He snapped immediately. And you need to stay away from her. I know all about your little love letters. What he said made my heart completely stop. How did he know about those? I'd written these letters a month into our relationship that detailed how long I was in love with her. She hid them deep inside her dresser. He'd gotten them somehow. He must have done something to her kicked her out of the house or worse. Maybe she ran away. I gasped and couldn't speak, but he did. She's gone. You won't see my daughter again, so don't even try. With those final crushing words, he slammed the door in my face. I jumped back, almost falling down. My hands were shaking. I was in disbelief. Resigned and with tears streaming down my face, I went home to face the disappointment of my parents. Apparently, her dad had also let them know what was going on all along. I never saw Catherine again. My best friend, the girl I grew up with in my first love, disappeared from my life forever. I did, however, eventually find out what happened to her from sources I won't name. After her father snooped through her room and found my letters, he snapped. He locked her in her room that night, where she stayed for two days while he arranged a ride from a friend to take her to some place where they would cure her affliction. I'm disgusted to even think about what that means, and what she went through. I'm out of my oppressive hometown, and married to a wonderful woman now. Some part of me always still breaks, though. Whenever Catherine crosses my mind, I hope she's okay wherever she is, and even if we can't be in love anymore, I still want my best friend, the girl next door, back. She never did anything wrong, she never deserved what happened to her. This happened in October of 2014. I'm originally from a small town, but I moved into a larger area in the Midwest for grad school. When this happened, I'd rented a room and shared a house with other students near the university. It was an older two-story house, with a one-story extension in the back which served as our living room. When you walked through the front door, there was a staircase immediately to the left, which went up to a hallway that turned right. In the hall, there was a bathroom, and my room was at the very end. There were two other rooms on the right side as well. At the time, I had three roommates, a girl who lived across the hall and a guy who lived in the other room upstairs. There was also another guy in the downstairs area. All of them were usually gone on the weekends, though. On the night in question, I was dating my girlfriend for a little over a month. It was Saturday night, and I'd picked her up in my car. 
We went out, had a few drinks, and took an Uber home. I didn't feel comfortable driving. We got to the house and went immediately upstairs to my room. We were the only ones there. After me and my girlfriend had some intimate time together, we fell asleep. I'm a pretty heavy sleeper, but my girlfriend is not. All of a sudden she nudged me awake to tell me she had heard a noise coming from outside. I told her it was probably just some drunk people walking by since we lived so close to campus. Maybe it was a raccoon or some other small animal. She seemed satisfied with that explanation and tried to go back to sleep. Just then though, we heard another noise coming from the back of the house. It didn't sound like people just walking by. This time, I got out of bed and walked over to one of my windows, which faced the area the noise was coming from directly. I had the curtains and blinds down. I peeked from around the corner and looked outside. My slight buzz and drowsiness went away immediately. My heart started racing like crazy after I looked outside and saw the silhouette of a person climbing onto the roof of the extension. My girlfriend saw my reaction and asked me what was wrong. I immediately told her to grab a phone and go to Jessica's room across the hall, lock the door and call 911 because there was an intruder climbing the roof of our house. My girlfriend did as she was told. I slipped on a pair of gym shorts and shoes and grabbed a kitchen knife that was on my desk, left over after eating some dinner and conveniently forgetting to clean it up the night before. How lucky for me. I stood next to the window with my back against the wall and listened in closely. I could hear the person walking along the roof, leaving light footsteps. Then I heard a noise. I could tell he was fidgeting with the bathroom window, which was right next to my room. Luckily, that window was already locked. I tiptoed outside my room into the hall, waiting to attack if he broke in through the window, knowing I had to protect my home and my girlfriend. I stopped hearing the noises coming from the bathroom window. Then I started to hear a similar noise coming from my window, the one I'd just been standing next to. My heart was pounding really hard now. I gripped the knife tight in my hand, mentally rehearsing on what I would do if they managed to break in. All of this occurred within just a few moments. I realized that maybe I could just scare the intruder away and avoid a confrontation completely. I took a deep breath and yelled, I have a gun, come inside and find out. I heard the thud of footsteps going away from the window and then the noise of gravel. I was sweating at this point. I walked outside my room and knocked on Jessica's door, telling my girlfriend it was me, and the intruder seemed to be gone. She unlocked the door and opened it. I saw she had been crying. I dropped the knife and hugged her. I told her everything was going to be okay. Just then, I saw the blue and red lights of the police outside the window of Jessica's room, which faced the front of the house. I told my girlfriend to come with me, so we could tell the police what happened. I walked downstairs, turned on the porch light, and unlocked the door, opening it slowly with my hands held up. The police were approaching with their guns drawn and saw me in nothing but shorts and shoes drenched in sweat. I kept my hands held up and told them I lived there and the intruder had ran away out the back. The police officer said something into his radio, some code or something. He said the intruder was still on the loose. He stood there with us while the other officer walked inside the house. I was told he was going to check and make sure there was no one hiding inside or something. After what seemed like a long while but was maybe only a few minutes, I heard a voice over the radio calling it all clear. We went inside and one officer began to ask us questions while the other poked around outside. After giving our statements, the other officer walked back in and told us it looked like the intruder had climbed on top of our garbage cans to get onto the roof. One of the cans was apparently tipped over. Since the house was dark and there was no light outside and no cars in the lot, we may have been victims of an attempted robbery. I asked the officer if there was any weapons they might have left behind in their startlement. He said no. It was unlikely the intruder wanted to harm anyone. There had been a series of break-ins during the last several weeks around campus. 
with the intruders mainly only taking prescription drugs. He advised me to get a better weapon than a steak knife for the future, and to keep the lights on inside and our windows locked, maybe consider installing outside lights. I asked if he could fingerprint the window, but he said he couldn't because nothing had been taken and no one was harmed. Most likely, this person had been wearing gloves anyway. The police told us they would have units search the neighborhood, but it was unlikely they would find the person, since I couldn't give a description of them, having only seen a silhouette. Needless to say, my girlfriend and I did not get much sleep that night. The next day, I called my landlord and told him what happened. The following day, we had a bright light installed on our back patio that turned on when it got dark automatically. We also installed a motion light outside the window upstairs that shines brightly if anyone tries to stand on the roof. Not content on just threatening a burglar with a gun, I went out and actually bought one. I now keep it in my nightstand drawer beside my bed. Every year, my town does a haunted house during the week of Halloween. I had been going to it since I was very young, and I still do go to this day. There was one time, however, when I was much younger, that I had a really bad time at one. I was in middle school at the time. There was a bully named Richard who always gave me a really hard time. Normally, I was able to avoid him and never got into any serious problems with him. I could stay around adults most of the time, and he would never do anything to me when they were around. I was planning on going to the haunted house on Halloween day, as I did every single year. It was really busy this season too. I always felt I had to go on Halloween. That just seemed way more authentic for whatever reason. I was 13 years old when this happened. We had school on that Halloween day. During my lunch period, I made a stop at my locker. When I did, a note fell out of it. I opened it up and realized it was from Richard. He told me that he would also be at the haunted house that night, and he would be the one to really scare me. I was nervous, but I wasn't really that worried. I mean, what could he possibly do to me in front of all the people that were going to be there? I had every reason to believe I would feel safe among that many people. It was dark by the time I got in line for the haunted house. It was just as busy as I thought it would be too. I was a bit nervous and kept looking around for Richard. I didn't see him anywhere in the line, and like I mentioned, I didn't really think he would try anything in front of so many people. As the line grew longer and people kept going in and out of the haunted house, I still couldn't see him anywhere. I eventually decided the note must have been nothing more than him wanting to scare me. I went into the haunted house and I was happy that they did everything so different each year. You could go through the house with your friends or by yourself. I didn't have anyone with me, so I decided to go it alone. I have to say, I was still a little bit on edge, but I was enjoying the house quite a bit. If anything, it actually enhanced the experience. I entered this room and the door shut behind me. It was dark, but there was a strobe light in the room. It was empty except for a chair that was sitting in the corner, and there was a scarecrow sitting on that chair. The strobe light made the whole scene extra creepy, and I was absolutely nervous. I knew that someone was probably in the scarecrow costume, and would get up and start creepily moving towards me. Then I would have to go to the other door and leave the room. Sure enough, the scarecrow got up and started moving towards me. With my heart pounding, I made my way to the door. Before I could get my hand on the knob, the scarecrow moved fast and grabbed me in a headlock. He pressed all his weight down on me, and I fell down to my knees. He was really, really strong. I heard Richard's voice whisper in my ear, I told you I would be here. It hadn't even occurred to me to think he might have been working in the haunted house. By that point, I was really scared. I tried to call out to someone for help, but he had his arm around my neck. He was choking me, and I wasn't able to make much sound. I actually thought the guy was going to try and kill me. I had never been so scared in my life. I only wished I had convinced my family to come with me that time. I don't know how long it was, but it couldn't have been too long before the door opened. 
I realized the next people touring the house must have opened the door to the room. I was hoping they would pull Richard off me, but they didn't at first. I found out later they thought the scarecrow choking a person was supposed to be part of the haunted house. Fortunately, they recognized me as being the person in front of them in line. They were three high school guys. They pulled Richard off me, and I fell to the ground. One of them went and got another haunted house employee, while I laid there trying to recover my breath. This is further good news concerning this story too. I didn't have to put up with Richard any longer at school for quite a while. He got sent to juvie right after, and he deserved it. 